So John, I'd love to start with Mad Men. It's a, it's a, it, all kidding aside, it's a great place to start with this audience. Uh, aside from being one of the most compelling shows uh, probably in, the, in this generation of television, I think it's arguable that Mad Men was the show that kind of launched binge viewing. Did, did you know when you greenlit that show with, you know, with foresight, did you know that it had the possibility of game changing not only television but viewing habits? Yeah, we had, uh, we had tremendous foresight with Mad Men. We actually uh, read the script and we passed. <laughs> so <laughs> we, did get a, we did get a second chance. Um, you know, what we saw in Mad Men was um, something that we felt being a disruptive kind of a company uh, was a bit of a challenge, something that was a uh, period piece, something that was going to be expensive, something that was for a cable network that typically you wouldn't think of being able to aggregate a big enough audience to actually make the economics work. Um, and uh, that was the challenge that actually made us want to take a shot at it. And we put together um, a financial model that involved a lot of moving pieces. We had a great partner in, uh, in AMC. Um, I, I do think it's, speaking of branding and, and branded integration, it's interesting. Still to this day, AMC tells me they're losing money on the show. <laughs> Hollywood accounting. So, uh, so you know, we, they, they don't talk about sort of the, the brand value of it. Of course, it, it, it's incredible, nor about the CPM increases they probably have had across the board with uh, all of their uh, programming for, for, you know, five or six years. Um, but again, we, we put together something we thought would be iconic, something that would be special, um, kind of worked out pretty well. So John, I want to take you back even before that. When you were running Sony Pictures uh, Television back in the, in the 90s, um, you did a groundbreaking deal back then. And some of the people may be in the room today. I think Erwin Gottlieb was the agency lead at MediaVest back in the day, and Daryl Sim uh, was the Procter & Gamble client, and you were running Sony TV, and I think along with Kerry McCluggage at Paramount, you did what was probably a groundbreaking deal with Procter & Gamble, which was one of the early times that a brand, at least in this generation of branded content and brand integration, stepped up at that level. Can you talk about that a little? Because it was really at the forefront of, of brands getting involved in content creation, safe soap operas and things of that sort. I'm talking about, as I say. I guess Carrie's was, what, Northern Exposure? Was that right, what right. you're talking about? But Sony so, was the primary player. So interestingly enough, by the way, uh, Irwin is still our uh, agency, and Mindshare is still our agency of record. Uh, and Daryl Sim has moved from P&G uh, to Omnicom, and he's on our board. Uh, which is great, and he's a great board member. Um, so the interesting thing about it, when you really l look at that, and say again, branded integration, the, uh, the Procter & Gamble deal really was uh, them coming in as a co-financing partner on all of our development, um, all of our, most of our, our production pilots, uh, as well as series deficits, and there was also an element in it which never really worked out well that we were going to handle a distribution of their soaps internationally, which they weren't doing a very good job of. Uh, and we had Days of Our Lives, and particularly Young and the Restless, we thought we could help them. Um, but what's interesting is that uh, other than them having their logo at the end of every episode, and therein, I guess, lies the, the brand integration and identification piece, um, there was never any uh, 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 ad efficiency, there was never any other piece of uh, the deal. They always thought being close to the content, being close to the, the producer, the studio, there would be opportunities down the road. The interesting thing, there was a little piece of reverse brand integration, which is that they actually passed on Dawson's Creek. Um, they had a, uh, an opt-out for, uh, for content, if you will, and what's interesting is they didn't want their brand associated with Dawson's Creek, and a deal that turned out it was actually a, a very good return on investment for them, uh, just because they had King of Queens that worked out really well uh, in syndication, but would have been even better for them had they picked that show. But again, if this is all about brand integration, that didn't really work for them. And, and the way I always heard the story, and again, I was an outsider, but it was that, that Dawson's Creek content was a bit too edgy for, for Proctor at that time. I and walked in here, by the way, there was a condom ad running, and I was thinking, <laughs> you know, not really that racy. Uh, but again, just if you think about it from that perspective, 
back then, that wasn't that long ago. It's certainly in the career span of many of the people in right. this room, obviously. Right. It was too edgy, and you wouldn't think about that. That would be on you know, family TV right now, Dawson's Creek, in terms Probably. of what. So, so John, let me talk a little bit about um, what you've done that's so remarkable in terms of building Lionsgate, together with a great team with Michael Burns and folks like Kevin Beggs, and, and who runs TV for you, and just a great team of people. But when we live in a world where <clears throat> companies WhatsApp sold for $19 billion. I don't think they have any revenue yet. You've built a company that is now got a market cap somewhere in excess of $4 billion based on kind of a brick by brick approach, you know, television, theatrical, at a time when people didn't think it could be done because so many of those, quote, mini majors failed. We could, the, the graveyard is full of companies that had one big movie and then thought they could go make movies and they didn't. And yet you've been able to do it. You understand, I think, franchise better than anybody in the film business. You had it with Saw, you had it with Tyler Perry, you obviously you acquired Summit, which had Twilight, you have Hunger Games. That vision to understand not just sequels, but the value of a franchise is important to people in this room because they deal every day with the value of a franchise, the value of a brand, and those are brands. Hunger Games is a brand just as much as any brand that people in this room represent. How do you how do you manage that? How do you how do you approach? You get it? lucky a lot, you know. Um, we we didn't build the company, and I remember there were a couple of times when Michael and I would uh, we would talk about you know where we were, stock price at a dollar seventy or dollar eighty, and it's you know it's about thirty one thirty two dollars now, and and we talk about it, and he'd say you know all we need is one thing. I'd say what is that? He said we need a hit. And I thought, that's genius. That's why you're an investment banker and I'm in the content business. But it's really true. And the, the, the truth is we didn't build the company that way. We didn't build it assuming we were going to have any hits. Uh, we built it. We actually, the, the business plan was buy three or four companies that had library because we wanted the evergreen income. Um, create sort of disruptive, interesting, edgy kinds of, of television and, and feature films. I mean, Saw was one of the first. Uh, had kind of a unique marketing campaign, uh, edgy marketing campaign behind an edgy show. A movie was made for $1.1 million. So, you know, uh, Hunger Games was made for a little bit more. <laughs> but we never counted on having the hits. I can tell you the great thing about our company is where the optionality is. You know, you're Disney, uh, and, you know, you have a movie that doesn't work, and you might write down $100 million, you're a $150 billion company. And we like to think that we've got a really steady company with evergreen cash flow um, and, and, you know, diversification. You said 28 shows. I think we're up to about 34 shows on about 24, 25 different networks, including the, the online, you know, over-the-top networks. But, boy, there's nothing like a hit that really drives, um, you know, drives your stock price, drives your profitability. Uh, I think, though, you better not count on those hits. Um, but when you get them, you better be able to maximize them. Um, you know, there were three, uh, three Hunger Game books. There are going to be four movies. There are three Divergent books. I don't know. Um, you know, so when you look at these franchises, you better be able to maximize them and, and drive them. So, John, when you mention over the top, uh, another important issue in this industry as we look at, at, at the way consumers are going to enjoy content, and not only the binge viewing that I said was ushered in, arguably, by Mad Men, but just the way we go, are going to receive it and consume it. Orange is the New Black, big hit on Netflix, uh, uh, you know, again. But you did something else theatrically, which I think, you know, bears some conversation, which was with the movie Margin Call and then the movie Arbitrage after that, you took that step, and again, this is where you've been a disruptor, you took that step of releasing that movie, both of those movies, Margin Call first, Arbitrage second, day and date. So just for those in the audience, you could get that movie on, on demand, or you could go to the theater and see it at the same time. How did the experiment work, other than probably the National Association of Theater Owners not being your best friend for a bit, was the experience fulfilling? Sort of like the NRA, no gun laws, a good gun law. Well, it, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, no, no uh, change of windows is good for the exhibitors. Uh, we four-walled the, uh, we the theaters, um, and the only chain that we've been able to work with a little bit in that, the bigger chains, was, was uh, AMC. Um, 
But it was, it was pretty interesting. And what we ended up finding out was that about 80% of the people that saw it, uh, in terms of VOD uh, and EST uh, that, that saw it, um, actually were aware that it was even in the theaters. And 80% of the people saw it in the theaters weren't aware that it was available. As a matter of fact, the, the joke was I was down in Tampa with my wife at the time. And she said, I'd love to see this movie Margin Call. It didn't even seem like her kind of movie. but. Um, so I said, okay, let me look and try to see where it is. And I kept looking it up on, on uh, movie ticks or whatever, and it was like, oh, there's one, honey, it's 15 miles away, and there's one. She, she said, well, you know, Cole, can they send us a copy from your office? And, uh, <laughs> and, and so I called, I called the office, and how stupid did I look when the guy, when our guy said, well, you idiot, you could just watch it right now on demand. And so, you know, what it speaks to, though, really at the end of the day is, you know, there was just a site, it was taken down, you all might have read about it, but it was called uh, Popcorn, uh, Popcorn Time, I think, um, and it was pretty amazing. It was done by uh, uh, Pirate Bay, and, and, and it was some of the best navigation and some of the most crystal clear uh, piracy that I've ever seen, and it was pretty scary to all of us, and the, the, the guy who was r running it uh, kind of took it down and said, uh, well, this just proves to all of you, uh, you thieves at the, the studios that you should give all the people the content for the price that they want it. Um, and I thought there's something horrible about that, but there's something actually right about it in, in one sense, which is that we have got to give the consumer, the consumer is making all the appointments in the appointment TV that we're in right now. We've got to give them a great value proposition. We've got to give them the content when they want it, where they want it. Um, and we've got to all be flexible. We've got to all be smart about this. And so, um, you know, doing things like margin call and arbitrage and, you know, continuing to push uh, different kinds of windows and different kinds of uh, variable pricing, um, you know, and we love being first to do that. We love being first to do, you know, almost everything and, and, and we keep pushing and sometimes it's the stupidest thing you can possibly think about. But we've, we've, we've found that it works for us, it energizes our management team and... So, as you make content decisions, and, and let me take uh, just to make the point, Mad Men again and Orange is the New Black. So Mad Men was released with the context of people watching it weekly, you know, or, or when it was delivered. Orange is the New Black with Netflix was done in the model of House of Cards where you can watch it all. If you can binge over the weekend and watch 13 episodes, good luck. Does it change the way you make content creation decisions? Or you, would, would that show look the same would Orange is the New Black look the same if it was going to be released on HBO, where we'd have to wait each week to watch it? Would that change your decision? I'd say the, the business decision, the economic decision, starts with um, looking at what I think the whole value of that series is going to be. So until we know better, I'd have to say that we want to do a better deal up front with something that's going to air um, you know, 13 episodes at a time. <clears throat> How's that going to affect our back end? How's that going to affect syndication? You know, we were pretty fortunate with Mad Men that a genre of, of programming means serialized programming that for a long time had lost its value in syndication, that all of a sudden along came some services like Netflix that actually valued it uh, and felt the consumer would value it. And so all of a sudden we got from Mad Men syndication numbers, not that I thought would never happen, but frankly that I couldn't count on. So when I build a model, I've got to look at sort of what I think that return is going to be. And I've got to look at a new model and say, okay, how do our current partners have to work with us in order to make the value proposition perhaps better a present value uh, basis and, and, and present time as opposed to sort of over the, the ultimate uh, you know, period of, of time we're going to syndicate the show. So John, you're a, you're a unique combination of, of somebody running a studio in that your background was television and, and still a very important part of your business and yet based on the numbers I'm guessing that the theatrical revenue with Hunger Games and things like that is probably larger although I could certainly find that out but from public records but you have a perspective of a marketer as much as any studio executive that I've ever met in, in my career. So when you're sitting in the audience and you're listening to this and you realize that you're going to be creating content that the consumer is going to enjoy when, where, and how they want, we all know that. 
How does the marketer play in that? Because I didn't watch Orange is the New Black with any commercial interruption because there is none. It was on Netflix. I didn't watch Weeds with any commercial interruption. It was on Showtime. It, the inextricable link between content and marketing messages is the bedrock of this industry in some way. How, how would you advise the folks in this audience as they're, because we have clients and agency partners in the room, how, how, does the, how does this over the top world really impact a marketer? Because you're a marketer as well. You spend hundreds of millions of dollars a year marketing your movies. So you're in the same position uh, when you're on that side of the conversation. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> I, I, you know, of course I would like to say the advertisers should all spend way more money getting close to the content. That's, that's an easy one. Um, I think, you know, we all have to do a better job of, of pushing the edges of everything that we do and trying, you know, new things. It's pretty obvious that for me, premium content is going to cut through the clutter a lot more than ordinary content. So, you know, if I'm a marketer, I want to be involved with premium content too. If I'm a marketer, I want to be doing, I think, what's obviously critical in, in today's age, which is being uh, much more focused on the audience that you really want to count on. And I think that was part of our plan, is not to compete with, you know, the huge uh, conglomerates in terms of four quadrant movies and even TV shows. It's like, let's aim at audiences we know, Divergent, we know exactly who that audience is. Hunger Games, we knew at least who the core audience was going in. Um, and so <clears throat> when we do that, we know where to market, where to spend our money. I mean, we're very extensive right now in digital uh, advertising right now, at least 25%. I noticed, by the way, uh, I, Obama in 08, I thought this was pretty interesting. I, I, Obama in 08, I think he spent $280 million to run, and 5% of his uh, budget was spent on digital. And when he ran again in uh, 12, I think it was something like $380 million was, was spent of which 25% was digital. That's only in a four-year period, and I think you know we're doing the same thing. Um, and it's not just digital spread all over the place. It's how do you maximize your your digital spend? Uh, we're doing some really interesting things right now uh, with Facebook. We were the first people to do their test on their new premium video ads, which I think they just announced last week. But we've been doing them over the last two months. Uh, for Divergent. Uh, we're out there right now, uh, again on Divergent, uh, using, um, uh, using YouTube's uh, mobile uh, app, mobile masthead. Um, but it's again, it's like understanding who your audience is, understanding who, who, where the core of that is and how to spend your money. And everything after that, for me at least, is kind of gravy. So you, you speak about digital media. It's another area, and I didn't mention it in, in the introduction, John, but I think you're probably now the second largest, Lionsgate is probably the second largest shareholder in Defy Media, which was Alloy and Break Media coming together, one of the largest, I think, in terms of revenue now, they're one of the biggest players in, in digital video online, uh, and, and again, you know, geared to a specific demographic. Break certainly was in Alloy. Similarly, on the other side, more girl, you know, teen girl focused and break more college humor kind of focused. Um, and, the, and I think the combined revenue makes them one of the, if not the biggest player in that space. Is that a place you see content moving as rapidly as people hope it will? And, and the, sort of the democratization of content creation? I think, you know, overall, uh, online, over the top channels, apps, whatever you want to call it, I think is, is absolutely where the future is. Um, I think, again, if you start narrowing your focus um, and looking at a fragmented audience, I think it's, um, you know, it's really going to be a way to reach the audiences that we want to reach, uh, customize the content for them, frankly, monetize the content in a more effective way. We've also got BeFit, uh, which we're doing. It's, uh, I think, the number one or number two fitness app on, on YouTube out of, I think, 150 of them. And we're, we're starting to monetize those kinds of apps and over-the-top applications. So. Um, I, I absolutely think that's the future. Um, you know, we're too late probably to build a significant linear channel bouquet, but really, um, I, I think maybe that's where the future lies, not only for us, but for a lot of other people. Yeah, I mean, when the, when the premium channels were launched on YouTube now coming up on three years ago, people said that was cable 20 years ago. How do you think that's working out in terms of it turning into cable? I mean, that was the idea. People looked at YouTube as, you know, sort of liberty you could launch all these channels and, and... It's really hard to know. You see so many metrics thrown around 
that, um, you know, Awareness TV is a, a, a good example. I mean, I think they're doing very well, but it's really hard for me to, to know exactly how it's being monetized, um, what the value of that, that, um, that consumer is, what the stickiness of that site really is. But, but I think that um, there's no question. We just made a deal with Freddie Wong. Um, you know, a really significant online player. I think we've got to all be trying these things and looking at them. And, I, you know, I do believe, I think within the next five, six, seven years, this can be some very, very valuable uh, brands built uh, online. Well, John, uh, I appreciate you taking the time today and, and sharing some of your insights. Congratulations on the great success, and, uh, and thanks for joining Thank us. Thank you. Thank you.